Ladies and gentlemen, in this section, we will look at some examples on Newton's laws and how to solve problems involving Newton's laws. Let's remember the laws. F equals zero means there is no acceleration, and there is no acceleration means there is no net force. If there is force, F equals ma, and whenever there is a force, there is a reaction force, which is the body being accelerated exerts on the other body, which is causing it to accelerate. Now we will look at some examples, but before, let's see our recipe for solving problems. We will first isolate each body, draw a free body diagram for it, show all forces, and do not show that things that are not forces, especially MA is not force, so we will not show it. Let's look at an example. I have two masses on a frictionless surface. I am pulling it with a force F. The free body for mass M1 is R F forward and the tension in the backward direction. And the force acting on M2 as the tension. These masses are at rest on a frictionless surface so that we don't have to worry about that. And since they are on flat ground, obviously the gravitational force and the contact force are canceling each other. We are not concerned about motion in the vertical direction. Now here I have the free body diagrams. Next, right? Newton's F equals MA law for each of these free bodies. Here, for the M1, M1A1 is equal to F minus T as F is pulling it forward, T backward. And for this, M2A2 is T. Well, in this case, we have three unknowns, A1, A2, and the tension T, so we need one more equation. For this, we will look for some relation between accelerations. These are called constraint equations. In this case, the bodies are moving together, so the acceleration of the first mass and that of the second mass are equal. This is our constraint equation. And then we solve all of these equations, Add, noting that the accelerations are equal and adding them up, we will see A1 equals A2, F over M1 plus M2, and tension is M2 over M1 plus M2 times F. Finally, check your results. Here, we will check if our results make sense dimensionally, because if an answer is dimensionally wrong, it is obviously wrong. The reverse is not true. An answer can be dimensionally correct, but still be wrong. But uh, a dimensionally wrong answer is obviously wrong. Here, acceleration has unit of force divided by mass, fine, and tension has same unit as force, fine, so our dimensions are consistent. For each problem, we will use this recipe. You might find it boring, but some of the examples that we will solve today will indicate that it may be worth the effort. We we'll go slow and sure. Our first example concerns two masses, equal masses M. Uh, one of them is hung from a string and the other is resting on a frictionless flat table. The pulley is massless and frictionless. The forces acting on these are Mg pulling the mass downward and tension T 
pulling it up, and tension T pulling this mass towards right. Here, our equations of motion are for this body, MA1 equals MG minus T. For this, MA2 equals T. Please note that in, for this problem, I chose the direction downward as positive. For this mass, I chose the rightward direction as positive. Our constraint equation is that the string length is constant, so that the displacements are equal. Therefore, their accelerations are equal. And solving these two, three equations, we get A1 equals A2 equals G over 2. And the tension is Mg over 2. A common mistake in this problem that we see as T equals Mg. This is, there is no reason to write this, but it is a very common mistake. If we do this, then acceleration of the hanging mass is mg minus t zero, and acceleration of this is t over m, mg over m is equal to g. The mass accelerations are not equal. This is a very common mistake. Please avoid. In our next example, we have three masses. The surfaces are frictionless, and the pulleys are massless and frictionless. The string uh, is of constant length. And in this example, we want to find the accelerations of the three masses. We draw the uh, free body diagrams. The only force acting on this is the T, similarly T. On the hanging mass, we have 2T pulling it up and M2G pulling it down. Writing Newton's equations, I have M1A1 equals T, M3A3 equals T, and for the hanging mass, M2A2 equals M2G minus 2T. Here, I took the rightward direction for the first mass, leftward direction for the third mass, and the downward direction for the second mass as positive. Now, I have three equations, but four unknowns. One more equation is needed. That is the constraint equation. Namely, the accelerations are not independent. The length of the string is constant, and that constrains the accelerations. If the first mass is moved by a distance x1, it shortens the string by x1. Moving this by x3 shortens it by x3. Similarly, the two vertical strings are lengthened by y2 each. As a result, the shortening here and the lengthening here must be equal x1 plus x2, 3 is equal to 2y2, and therefore a1 plus a3 is equal to 2a2. Now I have 1, 2, 3, 4 equations for my four unknowns. From these two, I see that a1 is t over m1, a3 is t over m3, and 2a2 is a1 plus A3, which is T over 2, 1 over M1 plus 1 over M3. Substituting in this equation, I get M2, T over 2, 1 over M1 plus 1 over M3 is equal to M2G minus 2T. We will now assume that M1 is 1 kilogram and the other two masses are 2 kilograms. Substituting the values here, we see that the tension is 40 over 7 newtons, and the accelerations are 40 over 7, 20 over 7, and 30 over 7 meters per second square. Our final example concerns the dolmuş that we mentioned earlier in the lecture.
The stone mush is moving on the road and the driver sees a possible passenger. He applies the brakes, suddenly stop, starting to stop the vehicle. Now I am weighing uh, with my mass 90 kilograms, I am standing in this stone mush. And as soon as he applies the brakes, I hold on to the, one of the vertical bars in the dolmush. The acceleration of the dolmush is 3 meters per second square. So I have to share with this acceleration, otherwise I will fall off the front window. To avoid that, I hold on for dear life and apply a force of 270 newtons. Now, according to a person on the sidewalk, I am decelerating by the effect of this force. According to a person sitting in the dolmush, I am stationary. Uh, there is this force that I exert with my arm, but he sees that I am not moving. So he concludes that there must be some other force which is pushing me forward. Uh, we call this force the fictitious force. As you can see, it exists only because the observer himself is accelerated. So uh, the, that observer sees me at rest with 270 newtons of my arm force pulling me backward and 270 newtons of the ghost force pulling me forward. Please note that the ghost force is not, is not, is not an actual force. Ladies and gentlemen, today we saw some examples of applications of Newton's laws. As you can see, the recipe worked in all cases, although in some of them you would probably have sold it much sooner without using that. Please note that the fictitious force in the final example is not an actual force. It is just the figment of imagination of the accelerated passenger, the accelerated observer. In the next lecture, we will see further applications of Newton's laws involving circular motion and also involving frictional forces.